Hey, what's going on guys? My name's Jeff. Hey, I'm recently new to YouTube. I got a stock market channel here. It's doing pretty good. Uh, a lot of interaction, but I've always wanted to do a video on addiction. Tell my story, um, how bad I was, and if I could just help one person with this. The reason why I wanted to do this now, um, April 1st was my five-year anniversary, the longest I've ever been sober in my entire life after spending almost two months in the hospital incapacitated with a 30% chance to live. I'll tell that whole story in detail too. But um, you about once a month, I'll pop into an AA meeting here in my state of Washington that I've never been to, or maybe one I haven't been to in a long, long time. And I like to sit down. I like to tell the chairperson ahead of time, hey, I, do you guys have any time for me to talk? I want to tell my story because it usually takes a long, long time. Um, I'm going to shorten this down in this video too, as short as I can, but I think a lot of these details in here are very crucial to get over with to, to you guys. Um, like I said, my whole thing is to maybe see somebody that's in the early stages of where I was. Like if I could have recognized how bad I would have gotten and being in detox nine times in a hospital environment and almost dying, I probably would have took treatment a little bit more seriously but in my case I can't stop drinking until I'm in a hospital that's how bad it gets you know I relapse I go to a hotel room and I drink until I can't walk and an ambulance picks me up that's how bad it is you guys so I'll tell that whole story I'm kind of jumping ahead of things here but what really got me thinking about this not only so much starting my YouTube channel recently but I went into a little Chevron station down here, down the road from me at about 6.45 in the morning. And it's a nightmare. Any little store is a, not a trigger for me, but it's just a bad memory because I've bought so much alcohol from little stores for my entire life, even when I was 18 years old, you know, buying underage, whatever. But a kid was ahead of me. I, I, I noticed him because he dropped something ahead of me. I never would really pay attention, but it was a Mike's Hard Lemonade, right? So he picks that up, and in his arms at 6.45 in the morning, he's got six of them in his hand. And that, for whatever reason, I it almost triggered me to start bawling right there on the spot because that's I've been there my entire life doing that it, since I was 25, locking myself away in hotel rooms and drinking and until an ambulance picks me up. I can't even walk and I go to the hospital and repeat and do that over and over again throughout all these years of, of relapses. So it really got me thinking and the guy looked about 25 years old, you know, in his mid twenties or so. Well, my turning point when I was, I had ceremony of the liver where I was hospitalized the first time was 32. So and I started me thinking, I always think about that when I see somebody struggling or an addict or especially somebody at 6.30 in the morning buying alcohol, strong Mike's Hard Lemonade, six of them at six in the morning. <laughs> but it always gets me thinking to where I was and, and all the struggles that I had and just the, the rough time. But that's why I'm doing this. If I could touch somebody, that, you know, in my opinion, I think there's different stages of, you know, not stages, but different types of alcoholics. This is my opinion. Addiction's addiction. It's horrendous no matter what level you're on okay but mine was so bad it literally cost me everything cost me relationships but almost cost me my life several times and how i'm here on this planet right now is beyond me and i'll tell you that story here in just a second but like i said if we could reach somebody in that younger stages maybe you know of where i used to be at that's kind of what my hope is for this video if somebody would see that but I'll give you guys a brief rundown of my life. Um, I remember being 20, no, I was probably 33. It was my first inpatient uh, visit. And a lot of you guys, I'm sure, have been to inpatient, but they had that uh, split you up in groups, you know, do your whole story of your life, which I'm going to kind of do right now in a condensed version. And most of you have probably never heard anything like what you're about to hear. Um, there's no nothing criminal, nothing abusive, nothing like that. Just basically me being an addict and almost dying and actually borderline dead, whatever you want to call it. Again, I'm jumping too far ahead. Sorry, guys. But anyway, I had a counselor in there and probably only one of the three counselors I've ever had in all the years in and out of, of treatment facilities that I respected. Um, in my opinion, treatment facilities are a money pit. Courts rehabs, all that stuff is just a racket to get money. 
nobody wants to be in there. That's a whole different video. I can do that later if you like, but I can ramble on about that for days. Okay, but this guy was an old Swedish guy, and he was probably 75 at the time. This is 15, 18 years ago. And I remember him, after I finished, you're supposed to take about 15, 20 minutes to do that. Mine took two days. Two days. And there's little 19-year-old girls in there that are in tears, and everybody's like, what the hell is this dude talking about? You know, talking about shit in his pants and peeing and not walking and seeing spiders on walls and wicked gnarly stuff. Okay, so let me get into the story, you guys. I'm going to give the condensed version that I can. So um, I have addiction in my family, grandfather, uh, father, and it goes back a ways to I am part Indian. Um, so I started drinking at, I think, about 14 years old, just like anybody else. You try it, uh, high school parties or whatever, and uh, it didn't really get too gnarly where I was getting drunk drunk till I was probably 17. So we had older friends that would buy us beer and we partied. We, I hung around a bunch of guys. All we did was drink, smoke weed and, you know, party like anyone else. Um, I drank all the time back then, probably four or five nights a week. None of us worked or we worked odd jobs or whatever we did. Um, but then I turned 21. So when I turned 21, I obviously started going to the bars. Um, 21 till about 25 was a constant party. I mean, I went to every bar in my area here. I lived in those bars. If I wasn't in a bar and for some fluky reason I had to go home, I would buy a 24-pack of Budweiser and literally drink the whole thing in a night, okay? This is early on. This is nothing compared to what I, I grew into, right? So you fast forward till about 26. It began a problem. I started, I noticed one day I was at work. It was a Saturday, right? It was a busy Saturday, and... I was in retail sales at the time. I was helping a customer, uh, worked at a car dealership. I've been in the car business forever. Um, and I remember just feeling super anxious, just this anxious and not so much at the time I didn't know, you know, hangovers are hangovers. Withdrawals are kind of different when you can recognize the two different ones, the, the, the meaning, you know, in, in true, I got to have a beer now type of a thing, which at the time I didn't really think was it. So long story short, I ran to the store and I was super anxious. I just felt off. It was the first time this ever happened. I grabbed two 24 ounce Budweiser's, went home, drank them, felt great, went back to work, rock and roll. So I continued doing that over the next about two year period to where it got to the point now I'm still working at this time okay I'm still functioning I'm going to work but I'm literally you guys drinking from the moment I get up at about 27 years old this started I couldn't it took me three beers two three four beers just to get in the shower drink a beer in the shower have two three four more before I even showed up to work at nine in the morning and that's no not even exaggerated so I would have anywhere from five, seven, eight beers just to be able to get in the door at nine o'clock in the morning. Luckily for me, the car business is a weird business where there's a lot of addiction going on, a lot of shenanigans. It's not like working at a retail outlet where you just walk in, show up and, hey, I'm here for work and you follow all the fancy rules. A little bit different. Everybody drank, everybody partied. Luckily for me, one of my best friends from when I was 10 years old was my manager. So we all kind of got away with whatever. Everybody knew I was drinking. Everybody smelt it. I tried to hide it as much as I could. Um, we've all done that. You know, there's there was no way around it because at the time I was drinking beers all day long and I was probably having 15 to 20 just during the day, right? Sometimes we go across the street to buzz in, have a hard cocktail and get really drunk. But this whole thing was just to get me through the day. So I would say for a good three year span before I got the ceremony of the liver, I was 20 beers deep, at least, you know, 18, 22 beers with some cocktails mixed in there before I went out. <laughs> you know, it's just, I love telling these stories. They're, they're horrendous. I like going through this because it just reminds me. That's why I try to do once a month to a meeting. I've never been to remind me how bad that this was. So where was I? So you fast forward a couple years and I got pretty bad to where I couldn't function. I couldn't, I wasn't eating. I, I would eat. It, it would take me until about five in the afternoon just to have like a, a half of a meal. 
and then I go out, drink, repeat. But that that after that, um, I started feeling really weird. I'd get up, um, probably I'm 28 at the time now, but I'd get up and just something was not right. And I remember in my room, I wasn't working. I lost my job at the time from drinking. Uh, I can't remember what I got fired for, but it was not showing up or drunk or whatever the case was. And I worked for a guy that I actually worked for six more times after that. He was an old addict. He understood it. But at the time, I no longer was employed there, right? So I'm at home. I'm on unemployment. I'm not doing anything but drinking purely around the clock. I'm going in. I'm getting two half gallons at a time every two to three days. That's just a sip out of while I'm drinking beer, I mean, around the clock. But I remember I'd get up, you know, 12, 1 o'clock because I'd be up all night drinking. But I would sit in the window seal of my house, stare out the window, and probably drink 15, 18 beers right there on the spot before I even considered getting up, considered taking a shower even, considered doing anything, not even productive, but just doing anything. Like, I lived literally right next door to a little mini market where I got most of my alcohol. I would take a cab to go get the hard booze. But... This walk was literally, you guys, uh, a half a block. And I had to get so much alcohol in me just to get over to that store to get more. That was my one time in 24 hours where I would have to make a trip next door a half a block. As sick as that sounds. So it got worse and worse and worse, right? So I remember just like nothing would stay down. I... um even the alcohol wouldn't stay down. I would take a drink, try to hold it down because I needed alcohol in me. I'm withdrawing bad, the shakes, the everythings, all of this. I didn't realize how bad withdrawals got until I got into the hospital. Um, this is detox trip number one. And keep in mind, I had nine of these total. So I couldn't hold anything down. I couldn't eat. I didn't eat for seven, ten days, maybe a bite of food at night, like one or two. I remember buying protein bars at night, just trying to get something in me. I don't know how the hell I even survived. Not a drop of water, just straight booze. Um, I remember looking at the clock because at the end there, um, I couldn't move. I mean, I literally couldn't. I'm peeing in the bed, pooping in the bed. I haven't taken a shower in weeks, but I can't move. But I remember the only thing I could stare at was the alarm clock. And I remember just wanting to sleep, desperately wanting to sleep. And I haven't slept. I mean, none of this stuff. And I found this out later after treatment and all that stuff that I, I wasn't even sleeping. You know, but I remember looking at the clock and it would be like 40 to 50 minutes would go by where I would shut my eyes and I would feel like I was asleep. And the second I would wake up, I'd be in a mad panic and try to drink. It was that bad. And it gets worse. Um... So, yeah, and then eventually my parents took me to the hospital um, in the emergency room. I checked in there. I remember them giving me an IV bag, and then they wanted me to go. I, luckily, it was a hospital, one of the only ones locally around me that had a, a real detox, you know, a, addiction, um, <clears throat> you know, opiates, hardcore stuff, alcohol, the whole thing that was in the hospital setting there was attached to the side of it. So they told me about that. I didn't think much of it. So I'm in the ER and it was probably 11 o'clock at night. So I remember sitting there. They said, okay, we're going to check into this detox place at 7 a.m. They have a bed open. They're going to get you over there. But boy, that 11 at night till 7 o'clock, they wouldn't give me anything. I couldn't have any water. They gave me a shot of something to this day. I can't remember what it is to kind of calm me down at work for seven or eight minutes. But I'm literally, I don't know at that time if I had seizures. I've had them, several of them. But at that time, I was, I remember shaking like a leaf, you know, kind of like seeing dots and weird stuff, you know. So long story short, I get over to detox, um, pretty bad shape there. I think the average time frame in there is five to seven days. Uh, first trip there, I was there 13 days. Uh, I was diagnosed with, I think it was called ceremony of the liver. And that's what <clears throat> I think why my body was rejecting food and everything else. I can't remember, guys. This is the <laughs> first relapse, you know, 18 years ago, whatever it's been. But it was pretty bad. My liver swelled up um, five times its normal size. It was literally bulging out of the side of my, you know, stomach area there. Um, I made it out of there. Um, I got out and... I had two DUIs at the time. I didn't mention those. I had two DUIs at the time that were pending. Um, 
got out, got into treatment, um, did it, took it pretty seriously. And then I started drinking again. I wasn't ready to quit. You know, I wasn't listening to anything major. You know, I, I wanted to quit, but I was just wasn't ready. Right. So started drinking again. Um, I really didn't do my treatment. I did some of it would drop out, pay a fine or two, drop out. So I ended up getting warrants, right, for the DUIs. I just, I didn't do anything. And the first time I got in trouble, um, it was actually my girlfriend. I, I thank her to the day, this day that she actually called the cops and said, hey, this guy's got a warrant. It was the only way, because I, I wasn't going to quit drinking for nothing. It was the only way to get me to not drink anymore. So cops come, haul me to jail. I'm like, okay. At that time, I wasn't, for whatever reason, I don't think I was too deep into drinking that heavy to where I was detoxing super bad. It was still bad. I remember sitting in there. Um, they sent, they kept me downstairs because it was like 2 in the morning when they booked me in there. And we had court at 7. So I remember going into court. I'm like, okay, you know, the judge is going to give me couple days in jail and we'll figure all this out get out everything will be fine i'll get my life back on track um judge threw me in jail for 60 days for just not doing what i was doing for the duis so <laughs> i did that i that you know never been in jail before never been in trouble they sent me to this place that was for driving only which was i guess if you're in jail it was kind of cool it was an old boys camp home um <clears throat> out in the wilderness it was actually beautiful up there deer everywhere and I was okay. You know, I, it was what it was. I got out, got myself back on track and then, um, <clears throat> made it about two years. I made it two years. And I remember I wasn't doing meetings. I had no cravings for alcohol, no missing bars, no missing the fun, nothing. Matter of fact, I, I went up and played poker two, three days a week in a bar setting at a big casino up there. It didn't bother me a bit. You know, I would look at people that were just, you know, obnoxiously drunk and I go, God, thank God that wasn't, it's not me anymore. You know, <laughs> thank you, Lord. Um, and then out of nowhere, my son at the time, my oldest son at the time was in Montana and he got in some trouble down there. I think he hit a kid in the face. It wasn't that big of a deal. They went to court and then they made him do some community service or whatever. But I remember it was really starting to stress me out and I'm not missing any bar scenes or nothing like that. And then about four or five days into it, you know, him getting in trouble and them figuring everything out, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to drink normally. And I remember going into a little store, you know, a little mini market type of a store. And I remember, okay, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to buy just a bottle of wine and have a glass or two at night. Okay. So I remember pulling in there. I remember Claire's a bell. I know the store. I could tell you things that were on the shelf almost. That's how vivid this was. And the reason it was so vivid is because I remember walking in, I took an immediate left to go down to the alcohol section. And that straight walk down there, I felt like everyone, all my family members, everyone, God, everyone was staring at me, telling me, don't do it. And I've never been so nervous, sweating to death in my entire life, walking through that beer aisle. So I grabbed it. I think I grabbed a bottle of just whatever cheap wine. Went home, I had two glasses, you know, kind of took the edge off. I'm like, okay, this is easy. I got this down pat. Okay, no problem. So, you know, I get, I go back up, I finish the rest of the wine off the next night. And I think I bought one more bottle the next day. And then I said to myself, okay, well, let's run up to the liquor store and I'll just buy a half a gallon. You know, it's cheaper that way. I can keep it in the cupboard. You know, remember, I'm only going to have two drinks a night, right? So I go home, get that half gallon. I've made it about two or three nights. You know, I was having two, three glasses, you know, just little drinks, nothing too major. And then one night, it was the, it was the, the, fr my Friday, which was a Wednesday at the time. And I said, okay, I'm going to have a couple more. So I'll make this one a little bit short. This is relapse number two. And this was probably the worst experience besides my last one that I've had because that old saying, I never thought much of it, is, you know, you, you leave off where you, I'm looking for the right wording. Sorry, you guys. You, you leave off where, where you started, whatever, you know, what I'm trying to say. So I had never thought anything much of that. So anyway, you fast forward 14 days is all this took to where I was basically almost dead with no, I don't even think, I don't remember eating during that whole duration. 
So I got, I was able to function the first few days. And then after that, I mean, I drank two or three half gallons a day. It's that much. My blood alcohol level has been 49.57, dead, clinically dead levels of alcohol. Um, so I can handle that type of stuff, as sick as it sounds. So I remember not being able to walk. I'd literally have to crawl to the bathroom at that time. I'm not peeing in the bed anymore, but I'm crawling to the bathroom. Okay. And I remember, okay, now I got to get some more alcohol. I'm out of alcohol. So I called a taxi. There's no Uber, none of that stuff around. This is in 2004. No Uber, nothing around. So I called a taxi cab at the time. The taxi driver comes to the door. I open the door. I can't stand up. I'm sitting on the edge of my bed. I crawled to open the door. My bed at the time was in the living room, was close to the door. Cab driver, I look for a cool, I was hoping he was a cool type of a guy. I told him, hey, look, I messed up. I've been drinking, man. I told him I hurt my hip and I couldn't get out of bed, but I needed some alcohol. So I give this guy a hundred dollars. I think I had like a hundred and eighty dollars. I remember having some cash. I gave him a hundred dollar bill and said, hey, here's my order. You can keep the tip. You know, I think he was buying me 30, 40 bucks worth of booze and he was keeping the rest. So that's a good deal for him. He comes back. Okay. So I tell him, hey, I'm probably going to need you tomorrow. You're available. So he gives me a cell phone number. I got this guy in speed dial. Dial. I got a cab driver running a half a block down the road, whatever it was, buying me orders of booze once a day. Okay. So I run out of cash. I give this guy my debit card. I know him from Adam, but this is my new driver here for, I think it was about a week. I can't remember. It was a blur. So long story short, never made it to the dumpster to throw any of this stuff away. Like I was getting at, I fast forward 14 days later, I finally um, called the hospital. I remember about two or three days before calling detox, trying to get a bed, and they were full, and then I would hang up or pass out on the phone or whatever. So long story short, I can't do this anymore. I call a, um ambulance, and the ambulance drivers treated me like, you know, and they didn't know. They're just some drunk laying in his house that can't walk or whatever, right? But I, I literally could not walk. I haven't taken a shower. I haven't eaten. I haven't done nothing. So they want me to walk down the stairs, and they kind of tried to, it might, nothing, my body was not working. So halfway down the stairs, they finally get a gurney, throw me in a gurney, take me up to detox, and, um, excuse me, guys, um, take me up to detox, and this was the first time that the withdrawals were unbelievable. Um, Again, I was so bad, they put me in front of the uh, nurse's station in the detox. It's kind of a horseshoe, like a U type of shape, and in front's the nurse station, and then they had uh, me right in front. There was two beds for the critical people. Borderline, you should be in the main hospital next door. So I remember sitting in there, and I'm shaking like a leaf. They're trying to get me to eat. They gave me, you know, they give you all this medicine, all the, the stuff for alcohol withdrawal. And when you first get in there, give you a shot in the butt that knocks you out for three or four days. I mean, it literally does. And I got kind of immune to that after the nine visits of there where it didn't do much anymore. And I'll tell you that in a second. So, yeah, sorry, this is just some of it's hard. But um, I remember sitting in the bed and I'm, I don't know, a couple, three days in there. And I remember sitting in the bed and there, <clears throat> you know, the big hospital, the doors, the big doors that open. And the big glass they had in there. And I remember like seeing something out of the corner of my eye. And I, I look over. <clears throat> and in the big glass part. And guys don't think I'm crazy for saying this. I know it's not real. At the time it was super real. Right? So I remember looking at the big um, glass area in there. I look over and there's John Wayne himself. John Wayne. In one of his old western movies. Sitting in the middle of the uh, the glass there. And these little Indian kids are poking their head around like that. What's that game? That whack-a-mole. They kept poking their head out at me. First time I seen that, I'm like, okay, I know what this is. I've been in treatment enough at this point to I know that that's withdrawal. I know hallucinations are real and they can't happen. But, oh, my God, this is scaring the hell out of me, right? So I'm sitting there. This went on for maybe that whole day. But <clears throat> I remember looking over at it. I kept looking over. I couldn't. You know, it's one of those things where you don't want to look at it, but you have to look at it kept glancing over like that and sure enough it kept happening and that went away or whatever so long story short I made it out of the hospital on that one and um I think over the next eight months um I was back into that same detox 
four times. Four, five, six. Yeah, it'd be four times in eight months. The la I, I ended up going to inpatient treatment on the third one. That's where I was telling you I met that old Swedish guy. Nicest counselor I've ever met. 50-year counselor. But, um, <laughs> where was I going with it? But the, the last time I was in there, I remember them telling me, and that was my safe haven. That's how I always felt, is that this detox. I felt safe in there. I felt secure. I felt, let me just get into detox. And I told myself this every time when I relapsed. Let me, I'm going to relapse. It's going to be bad. I'm going to feel like crap. I'm going to maybe almost die. I didn't really think in my mind I would almost die, but I knew I was in bad shape. But I'm tough. I'm the old jock athlete, right? So I remember at the time, um, they told me that you're you're not welcome back here anymore, dude. I mean, the doctor in there was a he was a hard ass, but he was he was that for a reason. You know, he wanted me to get to get you into treatment, which I think some of it was genuine from him. Some of it was because of the big racket, in in my honest opinion, you know, with the courts and the DUIs and the whole let's get you into a five thousand dollar twenty eight day inpatient treatment facility, right? So they said you're not welcome back. So <laughs> I get. And I'm getting out of there, and I did pretty good. Then I met a girl, um, which I shouldn't have done at the time. You know, don't start dating within that first year. Like seven, ten days. It was a girl that I knew from my past as a as a kid, you know, middle school and all that stuff. But it took me about three years to get into it. I'll make this part a little bit briefer. But it took me about three years. She knew who I was from the first time I went out. I showed her my discharge paperwork. A books, the whole shoot match. This is what I am, right? Even told her all the stories, the craziness that it is. To a non-addict, those stories are like, dude, what is wrong with you, right? So, um, yeah, it took me about three years to commit myself to being with her and moving in with her. She had kids. I had my oldest son at the time. So I move in. Everything's fine, you know. And my thing in a relationship, I've never really been in a long one, but... I don't know how to do anything sober, right? So the timing was not good. Um, so I didn't really know how to be affectionate and all that stuff. And then my main thing, the only reason why I ever relapse, you guys, is because of stress. Thousand percent. I know I mentioned that, but it's a thousand percent stress related relapse until you go to the hospital and almost die. So I relapsed with her over the, we spent 10 years together. I think f three times, no, it was probably four times, and three of those is when I went to detox also. And I've had a few detox runs, if you want to call them that, to that were not that bad. I would get in there, they'd give me the shot, the medicine, within a few days I'd feel good, you know, I'm ready to go home. And I'd get out and go, okay, cool, I'm going to keep myself sober, um, do all the stuff I got to do, keep my mind on track, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it was just like a ticking time bomb waiting until I drank again. Something would stress me out and I would drink again, you guys. And all of my drinking, you know, when I first got sober that I was telling you about, I'd never once stepped foot in a bar. This was all about either drinking on the side of the house, drinking in a hotel room, which I did multiple times, or, you know, hiding it and just hiding every bit of it like nobody knew. Right. So, um, you fast forward to things aren't, we split up, end up getting back together. I stayed sober throughout that. I did pretty good in there. Um, we got back together. This was in 2000. This was about a year before my almost death experience five years ago. Um, got back together, moved in. Um, I was still stressed because I knew in my heart my daughter, at the time, I had my youngest daughter who I love and adore. All my kids I love and adore, my two, my daughter and my and my boy. But so it just felt like I shouldn't, I shouldn't be in a relationship. You know, I love her. I still love her. I love her kids. You know, I spent a decade with her, right? But I just knew something wasn't right. You know, I just, I shouldn't be doing something. Not that I was doing anything bad. I just, and it was, the stress was just killing me. So, we made it about four or five months. We got along the first three months. Great. Oh, I love you. Everything's going to be fine. No, it's not. You know, and a lot of that's my fault. Um, so I remember getting just stressed again and started drinking again. Slowly, you know, I was drinking at the house there. It was, we were in a big house, so I'd kind of hide it on the side or I would 
hey, I'm running to the store, and I drink out in the car out there, right? And I was drinking a pretty good amount. I'm working the time, you know, throughout most of this stuff, besides the time I got fired, you guys, I'm working and relapsing and leaving jobs and all that stuff. So um, this was around Christmas. This is probably 10 days before Christmas. And we got in one last fight where, you know, this is it. I'm leaving, right? We just couldn't do it anymore. And I'm drinking pretty good. And I remember in the room, she left me in the room for probably four or five days. And at this point, I remember sneaking out the round of the house and running down to a little Bartell Drugs and grabbing two half gallons at a, per day. I'm burning through these half gallons today. For whatever reason, I'm still functioning. I'm still okay. So I get out of there. I go down to a hotel room and lock myself in there for about two weeks. And how in the world I came out of this without... Um, Going to detox, I don't, I still to this day don't know. Because at that time, I think I had the endocarditis of the heart, which I'll tell you guys about in a second. But I got myself sober, and it was in the hotel room. I, um, you know, I drank for three weeks straight. I did have a little bit of food in me. I tried to drink a few drinks of water a day. But, I mean, I was bad. You know, I was not functioning. I, I couldn't get up to the bathroom. Nothing. Just as I laid in this hotel room, and again, I always found hotels, and I used to stay in a bunch of them, that were so close to the booze store for that reason, because I knew there was no way I was driving, but I would walk over there, grab some booze, and be able to walk back. That was my one shot per day, my big outing, my big trip, you know, going around the corner to, the, to get more booze to last me a 24-hour period. That was what I did. Um, but I got myself sober. I don't know how the heck I did it again. And it was like four days before Christmas at this time, I think, because I remember I drove over to my mom's house. I stayed over there, got myself sober, called my boss, who I love and adore to this day. This is a different guy than I was telling you about before. An old ex-addict himself. I worked for him for about six, seven years. <clears throat> but he um, he got it, and he, me and him got along good. Like I said, I, I still talk to him today. I don't work with him anymore, but he knew that. And so long story short, I go back to work. I get out. This is after Christmas. I had a decent Christmas, you know, um, went with my brother, did all that stuff. And then I went back to work like January 2nd. And this is almost done, you guys. This is the, the bad one. This is uh, a little over five years ago. So I make it through. I get back to work January. I make it till, I don't know, about the 20th or whatever. I think it was of January. My dad has a blood clot in his leg, right? And my dad's a stubborn, he's drank for 50 years, stubborn old hoot, you know. And I remember I was staying with them at the time, and I remember hearing him through the door, and I was out around the corner there, but I heard him breathing where he couldn't breathe. He was <laughs> real quick breathing. And I'm like, holy crap. And I had to get to work. I had a manager's meeting to get to, and I'm like, this is not good. So long story short, we call him an ambulance, and remember, I'm sober a month. I'm feeling okay. You know, I'm me and the ex are done. Uh, back at work. Let's just give this another whirl here, right? So we take him to the ER. We get him in the ER. And he's still breathing like that. The doctor comes in. They finally figure out it's a blood clot. They couldn't figure it out. Whatever. They end up sticking the tube down the throat. Remember, guys, stress is my number one thing. So I am freaking out. I'm like, oh, my God. And I remember the doctor coming out, and the doctor, I said, well, what's going on? What's going on? Can you tell me anything? doctor's kind of an ass. And he says, uh, you're, he goes, what did he say? He goes, your dad's probably the sickest man in this hospital. And walked off. And that's all I needed to hear to get over to the, the booze store. I remember Claire's a Bell was a little tiny store again. There's my nemesis, those tiny stores right around the corner. I walked in there and I bought a 24-pack of Miller Genuine Draft cans. Put them in the car. I remember driving back to the hospital to get in there. We still don't know how his condition is, right? They got the tube. They can't do anything at this hospital. They want to rush him downtown, blah, blah, blah. So we're waiting for that. I don't know what's going on. I'm freaking out. And I remember going right around the corner. I was gone maybe a half, not even half, 25 minutes. Bought that beer, stuffed it in the trunk, drank probably six, seven of them before I got, you know, in, I can drink six, seven beers in four minutes. Pounded those things down, got back in there. Okay. And then he ended up being, he was going through some withdrawal stuff too, nowhere near on my level, but they ended up getting the blood clot under control. But he's still in ICU. He's in bad shape. So I'm stressing out. 
at this point, I call my boss, David, says, hey, uh, my dad's not doing good. I'm going to stay here. My mom's here, blah, 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 right? So then I start drinking, right, uh, a lot. And he was in there almost a month. And that whole time, I'm around the clock drinking. I'm going in there. I'm going down the road drinking <clears throat> around the corner in the bushes. There was a high school across the street from the hospital. I'm over there knocking out any sort of alcohol I can, wine, mad dog, all anything, right? Um, I think I did end up getting a little bit of hard alcohol too, but just the massive intake. And that went on for about three weeks. And he got out and then I ended up, I'm to the point now where I got to keep drinking. I'm in bad shape. This is one of the, the most quickest that I got this bad, that quick, you know, that fast. So at that time, I grabbed, <clears throat> I, uh, I think I drove, as stupid as that sounds. There was times where I was belligerent, where I would lay there, and times where I was coherent. And I remember driving down to a hotel and... Uh, I ended up paying for, so I knew something told me that I'm going to be there a while, right? So I ended up paying for maybe 10 days or something. I can't remember at the time. It was probably 10 days. I know it was a little over a week. So I get in there, and again, there's a little store next door, right? I get in there, and before I went down there, I stopped off at a big grocery store. They sell hard alcohol down here, and I ended up buying in there, I think I bought like, um, what's it in a case of half gallons? I think I bought three of those. So that would be six, 12, 18 half gallons. I think that's what it was of sky vodka. I was vodka and Gatorade, right? Or straight vodka. Didn't matter. So I buy 18, um, <clears throat> half gallons, you know, three cases. I think the cases had six in them. you know, the booze boxes had six of them in them. So I ended up buying three of those get in the hotel room there I are so I'm like okay I got a, a protein bar next door I got a Denny's in front of me okay let's just see what's going to happen so start drinking and remember keep in mind three weeks prior I'm in pretty deep you guys and with me again it's the amount of alcohol and no food and no water is indescribable how anyone's body can go do that to them you know, I tell a lot of these stories and people think it's fake, you know, that, oh yeah, you go out and drink 40 beers a night and all these half gallons and shitting yourself and not eating for a week. How I'm on this planet, I don't know to this day. I honestly don't. So I'm in the hotel room. Okay. <clears throat> this is a hard one, guys. So bear with me. Um, I'm in there. I'm, you know, I got a couple protein bars. I'm trying to, I'm telling myself, okay, let's slowly drink half gallons throughout the day, you know, like one half gallon a day. So I, I would drink those, but I would walk next door and this happened. This is why the original thing I said at um, uh, the beginning of the video about seeing the kid in the store at 630 in the morning, because there was a little yellow, one of them Chevrons right next door and they'd open at six. And for whatever reason, on my time clock, I'm not sleeping. I'm passing out for 30 minutes, waking up, drinking around the clock. Um, but for whatever reason, I'd go over there at 6 in the morning. And I'd go in there at 6 in the morning, and I would buy three, because I couldn't carry anything heavier than that, because I could barely walk over there. It had to, I had to drink around the clock to get enough, feel enough okay with enough alcohol in me to make that walk of a, right there. You could see it. So I'd go over there right at six, and that's again what brings me to seeing that kid in there in the in the store at six thirty in the morning. If I go over at six, bring that back. So I'm drinking the eighteen half gallons. The I, I don't I didn't drink all the eighteen of those. Um, they were Mike's hard lemonades too. Um, I didn't drink all of those a day. I just had them like laying on the side. I was so incoherent and literally half dead the last few days that I didn't even know. It was just like I had to rush to the booze store and boy, I would panic if I was out of alcohol, but I always made sure I had a ton. So this time the hotel room that I'm in is destroyed. Um, I, I'd not thrash like partying, just, you know, 
never took a shower, pee, poop. I clogged the toilet up to where the toilet didn't work. It was just a death trap in there. There's literally, I don't know, uh, hundreds of alcohol containers in there. No food, protein bar, and the Denny's. Remember I wanted the convenient Denny's there? I made it there once, and it was the first day. <clears throat> um, so... Um, I make it about, I remember going down the last four days and I remember, I didn't even know if I was out of money, if my credit card worked or whatever, but I remember, you know, I make it the 10 days and the, the half gallons are gone. So that means I'm averaging almost two a day, plus all the other Mike's hard lemonades, no food, not a drink of water. I uh, wasn't taking my blood pressure medicine, nothing, nothing. And I went down, I paid for like three days. No, I tried to take that back. I tried to pay for a week. My card was declined. So I tried to pay for like five days. I don't know how this guy left me in this hotel room or why in the heck he didn't see what I was doing up there, but I could barely even stand up. Again, it took me all day to get enough alcohol in me to get down there, to even make my body functional. Because when I didn't have enough alcohol, when I mean enough, I'm probably a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to where I can't function. I need to be a 0.5 and higher. And I, that's just how bad it is. And I know that I've been on those levels because I've had my blood drawn and taken to the hospital. And my second DUI, I wasn't even barely drinking and I blew a 0.39. And the guy goes, I remember the cop goes, geez, I wouldn't be able to know my name because you're acting completely normal. And I remember telling him, it's bad, dude. So long story short, I think I paid for, my card finally goes through for the last four days. And those are the last four days I'm in this hospital or in the, not in the hospital yet but I'm in the um, hotel room. And at this point, the last four or five days, probably, you know, again, it's all blur. I'm not in good shape at all. I'm, I can barely move. I end up uh, finding enough alcohol in the room, probably the last three or four days, you know, like scrounging around through all the dead soldiers on the ground. And that's when I realized, that's what made me realize is that, you know, I had a probably... 30, 40 more Mike's Hard Lemonade. So in my mind, there's plenty of them in there, right? I haven't keep mine, I haven't eaten. I'm taking one or two bites of one of those Tiger Milk protein bars a day at best, one or two a day. Um, not a drop of water, like I said, and just straight booze and trying to sleep where I would sleep 30 minutes and it wasn't sleep. It was passing out and then trying to get up and drink more. So... At this time, I know I'm in deep, dude. I call my little sweetheart doctor. I love her to this day. She's still my doctor. She knows everything about me. Sweetheart. Little Asian girl. She looks like she's about 12 years old, but she's godsend. So I called her, and she called me right back. Most doctors are not going to do that. And I told her I'm in trouble. Call me back. So she calls me right back. I made an appointment in the detox with her. This is three or four days before I end up going. Okay? I canceled. The next day, my phone, and I'm not answering. You guys, I forgot to mention this. Throughout all of this, all these stories, not one person in this planet knew where I was. I would have to find different hotel rooms to lock myself in because I didn't want anyone to find me. I'm not answering one phone call. I can't even work a phone. Okay, so that's important, too, to show how bad a shape I was in. So I didn't show to the detox appointment. And I remember my, I, I looked at a text from my, I think it was my brother at the time, and my phone's blowing up. I'm not even paying attention to it. I don't care, right? It's not that I don't care. I'm an addict, and I'm screwed up beyond belief. So I look at the uh, a text from my brother. It says, hey, the Snohomish County Sheriff's here looking for you, you know, a welfare check because you didn't show. My doctor called the cops saying, hey, I'm concerned about my patient. He didn't show up for a detox. He's a bad addict, and, you know, God bless her for doing that. I still ignored it. The next day I'm really bad. I, I know something's wrong with my body. I'm not, I'm not breathing right. I would go, it felt like, like a minute or two with, without breathing. And then I would like gasp for a breath. I don't know. I'm here. I don't know at the time what happened. I remember asking my doctor about it and he said, dude, you almost fucking died. Sorry, my language. You almost died. That's what probably was going on. So now I'm kind of concerned, even though I'm that messed up, I have nothing in me. I'm taking a few breaths per minute. It felt like I know I'm not good. 
So I end up calling my ex ex, which is a, I've known her since we were three. We had my oldest boy together, Sarah, and my son. Um, I couldn't even talk to call detox to get an appointment set. I was trying, I remember the last day, it felt like a month of trying to work my phone. It, the battery was dead. I tried plugging in. I couldn't, I'm not functioning. You guys, I'm really honest to God, not. Somehow I ended up getting a hold of her because I could not figure out how to call this detox place. I had the number programmed into my phone. So I couldn't do it. She ended up doing it. Okay. Sorry, guys, it's taken so long. It's just, it's tough, but I do want to, I like, I want to get it out there. So she ends up calling for me. I finally tell her where I'm at and I have an appointment at seven. So I remember telling her, hey, give me, come here about 630 because I wanted to get enough booze in me. And that was my thing, drinking in the detox parking lot, you know, having one last hoorah. So to where, because I was so, I couldn't even, I'm not breathing, right? I'm not functioning. My body is shutting down. And how I'm here this day and made it out of that hotel room is beyond me. And it gets worse, for Christ's sake. So she ends up picking me up about 6.30. I remember her walking in the room, and she could not believe what was how that hotel room was, how it smelt, the booze. And I remember her looking at me. I vaguely remember. I remember her looking at me like, you know, this is not that big of a deal, you know, trying to assure me. And then <clears throat> my son was there, too. I wish he wouldn't have been, but he was there. God bless him. But they had to... I don't know how we made it to the car. They, I think they carried me down into the car. Um, at that time, I had, uh, it was three, one McDonald's cup, a big, large McDonald's. I don't know how I got a McDonald's cup. There might have been a Denny's cup or something, but that thing was topped off with uh, the Mike's Hard Lemonade at the end there. And then I had two water bottles filled with it on the way to the detox. And I still, I'm not breathing right. I'm not, my body's not working. I can barely drink because it's all thrown up. My stomach lining, everything's gone. You know, you're throwing up that black tar stomach lining crap. For some reason, I end up hammering those down, most of them, I think. So I get into the detox facility there. They check me in. I'm, you know, I'm a regular there. I could tell you right now the whole process of it. Sit down, try to sign this thing. I couldn't sign nothing. I couldn't fill out anything. They poured me in there somehow. I'm drinking that last drink in the parking lot. So I end up getting in there, and they usually take you into a room before you check into the hospital portion. Nice setting. It's kind of like a underneath a building type of a the, the hospital there. You know, real quiet in there and everything. But you go in and check in, and they're going to ask you questions, take your blood pressure, you know, are you this, you that, the other thing. And I couldn't even go in there because I couldn't sit on a chair. My body's not even working. So they wheeled a bed actually in the hallway and did it from the hallway inside the detox thing. So I'm laying in the bed there and, um, <clears throat> you know, I did all that stuff there. And I remember, and I remember the other nine, eight times prior to that is just begging for that shot. Cause you felt so much better after that shot. I'm begging, please give me the shot. It was a huge needle right in the butt filled with wonderful goodies of medicine that made you feel better begging for that shot. And of course, and I know this too, I could work at this place. They got to, you know, it's, they send it upstairs and the doctor's got to sign off on it. It's like 45 minutes away. And that 45 minutes felt like five days when you're feeling that terrible. And I'm not functioning right. I'm falling all over, rolling off the thing almost, just still breathing bad. I don't remember much because I think I, I had, you know, enough booze in me to not even know anything really. And before that, it was just, it's just so hard to explain all of it. You know, when you're a point four something and um, you don't you don't have enough alcohol in you is a problem. So, OK, I get in there. Um, I get checked in. I remember going to the room. They took me out of the cart because of the rooms are in there, have the beds in there or out of the gurney. They put me in a wheelchair. I vaguely remember that. And then I remember I remember I don't remember getting in the bed, but I remember in the bed and um I remember asking for a garbage can for whatever reason I remember that and then they gave me the shot and then I remember maybe 15 minutes later of just passing out or going to sleep whatever happened and that was April 1st five years ago on the, the first of this month so 
And then I don't remember anything, you guys, till the 40 days later, 38 days later. Um, what happened in the detox, I was physically in the detox there for seven days. And um, I don't remember not one second of it in there, not one second until waking up 45 days later. This is what they're telling me. So they, what happened was, is after day seven, I stopped breathing. Um, and then they rushed me to ICU, which was literally right next door, right? So I stopped breathing. They rushed me into um, the ICU next door. And when I woke up, I'll, I'll tell the story of waking up, and then I'll kind of fill in the blanks with what I was told, right? So I remember waking up, you know, it was 38 days later. Um, not... <laughs> No clue what's going on. I have so much medicine in me. I have so many problems. They're talking about dialysis. My kidney's not working. I had a massive heart infection, which is endocarditis of the heart. I had to go another 45 days after I got discharged to get, I had a pick line in my arm that went directly to my heart. And I had to go in there for two hours a day and get this strong, gnarly medicine that killed this infection after I got discharged. It was that bad. So I wake up and I remember sitting there and I remember looking outside and there was like a window, big windows, and there was a building next door. Now to this day, I don't know if I was dreaming still or I was woken up or half out of it, whatever. It's that half dead feeling hospital and I almost did die. So, and then I remember seeing IV bags behind me. There was multiples, the tube in my throat, right? And then I pass out. I remember going like in and out. And I had these dreams. I'm going to tell real quick, just a couple of them. Now, I don't know if this was me actually getting ready to die, because I know that I almost did, or if God was sending me some sort of something, but they were, they were dreams, but they weren't dreams. And they were so vivid and real and the memories of them and the feeling of being there. And I don't know how to explain it. I tried to talk to people about it. I even tried talking to a counselor about it. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if it's a pre-death type of an experience or whatever it was, but they were pretty wicked. But I'll tell a couple of those, too, because I think it's important to just to show the nastiness of it all. Um, I remember being in a... It was. This is the whole breakdown of it. I'll do it real quick, you guys. Sorry for all the rambling. But it was. Uh, I was in the detox. Remember my safe haven? Um, and for whatever reason, they kicked everyone out. Like their insurance was no good. I remember something about insurance being no good. And they said, we're transferring you to a, um, another hospital that took your insurance or something. Right. So this old school, like from the 1940s or fifties ambulance pulls up with two nuns. They were nuns, but they had the nurses. Remember the old nurse thing with the cross on the front? They had the nun outfit on. But a, a nurse um, head thingy on. So those two nuns fired me into this old school ambulance. Not a word was said. They both sat in front. I'm in the back of it. And we're driving to the other hospital. Okay. And all I remember is just quick drive. And then all of a sudden going on this dirt road that took you down. It was like a long winding. And it felt like we kept going down and down and down and around corners and all of that stuff. So... Then we get down to the bottom and there's this old, old, old church. And it was beautiful. It, was, it didn't look so beautiful on the outside, but in the inside it was gorgeous. So we pulled down there and I'm like, you know, I, I, in my dream I kind of think, or whatever this experience was, like, God, this is weird. So they wheel me in there and it's a church, right? And beautiful church inside. It, it, I remember it like this, like I was there, Okay. All the, 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 the seats in there, beautiful wood, and up above it had a, uh, it went around upper tier, and there was like, uh, you know, some, uh, beautiful curved openings, like to different rooms up there. It was just gorgeous. And in the front of it, there was two hospital beds, right? And it had the beep, 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 beep in front of it, right? So <clears throat> they plugged me into that thing there, and I remember sitting there, and I'm trying to, I think I was thirsty in the beginning and then I like couldn't breathe right and I remember asking for help and I kept looking and there was a nurse walking around up there with a clipboard and um she just ignored ignored me. 
And then it was like harder to breathe, harder to breathe. And then I start watching the machine and then it flatlined. And uh, that was wicked. I don't know what that was. You guys can take it for what it was, but I know that it did happen. It just gnarly stuff. Just gnarly stuff. And then I had a couple more. I won't go into this thing's getting long. I won't go into all of those stories, but just wicked stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I woke up and I'm kind of too. They end up um, taking the throat thing out. I had a really nice nurse. It was a male nurse in there that really took care of me. It was, you know, patient with me and the other ones weren't. They had the the alarm set up on the bed. Like, I remember if I moved too much, they the alarm would go off and um, four or five nurses would come running in there, right? And <clears throat> all the medicine. I remember I I was kind of halfway there or whatever, and I, I asked the nurses, hey, I got to pee. He goes, well, you got a catheter in. Just pee. I'm like, dude, what is going on? I mean, this is beyond just wickedness. I I don't even know how to explain it. Um, so I'm in there probably another, I don't know, it was probably two weeks. You know, I started getting better. Um, <clears throat> what happened was is... All of this was caused from drinking the endocarditis of the heart, which is a nasty, nasty heart infection. Um, <clears throat> kidneys, my whole body was shutting down. At one point, they told my mom, they called my mom and told my mom that he's probably got about a 30% chance of making it. And she didn't tell me that. One of the doctors ended up, because I wanted to know more. I kept picking at him. He didn't want to tell me, but he, I remember him telling me that. But, you know, I ended up, getting out and it was a two month recovery to where I even felt, you know, halfway normal. I mean, I almost checked out there, but <clears throat> going in every day at two o'clock, I had to go into <clears throat> a little, uh, hospital clinic there. And I remember they inserted the pick line, a girl, a uh, nurse went in there and found her way from my arm to my heart. And the pick line was hanging out of my arm for two months, but I had to go in and get that, uh, those strong medicines. I had to spend two hours a day in the hospital while these medicines pumped into my body. Um, <clears throat> the hospital bill, which I got lucky, I won't get into that with the insurance. Um, they covered it, but the whole hospital bill and everything after that was uh, like $1.3 So not a proud moment, but that's all handled and taken care of. But the one thing I'll say through all of this is I probably don't go to enough meetings that I should go to. I go to about one a week and then once a month, I'll find the one meeting where I can speak and basically say this exact same thing. Um, I, I really like doing say, doing this, what I just did, because it's kind of therapeutic for me, I guess you could say. Um, but the one thing I'll say is that I'm never, ever going to say that I'm not going to drink again. But if I end up do relapsing again, it's a death sentence. I, I know that a hundred percent that I will die. There's no way around that. You know, I, I just know that. Um, I think I, I missed a ton of other stuff. I tried to keep this as short as I can, but I'm an hour into it, you guys. But yeah, I like, I like sharing this. And then it really made me think coming up on the five years that I just had was super awesome. I've never had five years sober since I was a small kid. Um, but was seeing the the kid in the store anytime I see that because I know he he was bad, you know, and that's what made me do this this video here because just that whole you know six thirty in the morning any ninety nine out of a hundred people would look at that kid and just go you know it's just a kid maybe he's buying some booze for you know after work tonight no he was in bad shape um but that's it you guys um. <clears throat> Hopefully this will reach somebody. Um, hope you like the story. Not so much like the story, but maybe you can appreciate it, whatever that wording is supposed to be. But um, you guys, thanks for listening. Um, stay, get to meetings, do all the stuff you're supposed to do. But uh, yeah, that was kind of rough for me to do. But uh, now the whole world's going to see it maybe. But that's what I want. I truly do. Because like I said in the beginning, addiction's addiction it ruins lives it ruins careers it ruins everything it does everything but in my opinion there's certain stages of addiction you know a lot of people 
a lot of counselors that don't know, don't know the difference and they'll just, oh no, you're an addict. Or, there's, there's levels to that. And with my level, and then that, I told you guys that old Swedish doctor, oh, I didn't throw in that part. I'll throw this out and I'm going to get out of here, I promise. But I remember him after the two days, remember when I was um, doing the two days where I was talking about my whole life's history? Or keep in mind, this is a 75-year-old man that's a true addict. This guy's 50 years sober. And he took took off. He had those little tiny reading glasses. You know, two days, I'm into telling him. He took those things off. He looked at me and he goes, Jeff, he goes, I've done this a long time. And he goes, I've never heard anything like that at all. And I remember that. I had relapses after that. But I remember that, like, you know, not that I'm proud of that, but it's pretty bad. <laughs> okay, guys. Love you all. Everybody stay sober. Uh, hope you enjoyed it or whatever word I'm trying to use there. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.